Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So, hello friends, uh, this is second lecture on rights and today we are going to discuss different uh, theories and the conflicts inherent in these theories about uh, rights, their different conceptions or interpretation of rights and uh, the inherent tension or conflict that is there in these theories about uh, rights and what kind of rights individuals should have and on what basis we should uh, determine what kind of rights an individual should have, should it be on the basis of this conception that individual is independent and autonomous of his or her community and therefore certain natural inalienable absolute rights must be recognized and protected for the individual or we consider individual as a member of a particular community and therefore, the rights that we uh, recognize or protect for this individual should be on the basis of this recognition that individual is not autonomous or isolated from his or her community, but embedded in his or her community. And therefore, the rights that we give or sanction to that individual should be also because of his membership to that particular community. So, some of these issues that we are going to discuss while looking at the theories on rights of uh, libertarian, communitarian and multiculturalist perspectives. And finally, in the second part, we will discuss the Asian value debate that is in a response to what is regarded in 1990s as a kind of a limited or selfish understanding or self-destructive paths of a Western modern capitalist uh, mode of development. And in response, to those models of rights, individuals or values, there were many leaders in uh, Asia responding to the values of community, social order, uh, collective welfare and so on. So, within uh, Western conceptions also, there was the focus on this idea of say common good versus individual good and so on. But in Asian value, the primacy of collectivity uh, or the uh, community was uh, much more uh, given importance than in this western reconfiguration that we will discuss. But prior uh, to discussing these theories or Asian value, we will also look at um, um, Ronald Dworkin conception of taking rights seriously in his response to positivism which tries to reduce rights through a kind of understanding on the basis of understanding of collective or common good um, and in the interest of common good it wants a certain rights to be limited or controlled. Um, and also we will uh, discuss the uh, four uh, types of rights which we will identify by uh, looking at the relationship of certain kinds of right to the corresponding obligation and duties and then we will move on to discuss some of these theories. So, in the concluding lecture um, on rights uh, that is third uh, lecture, we will discuss uh, human rights and in human rights we will again discuss some of the rights that we have already discussed that is political, civil, social and economic and so on. And then we will conclude our lecture on rights by uh, discussing the relationship of rights with duties, rights with obligation and so on. So, there are many tensions and conflicts in not only different types of rights that we have already discussed. For example, between moral and legal rights, political, civil on the one hand and socio-economic rights on the other, individual and group rights, 
human or non-human animal rights or environmental rights and so on. So these tensions and conflict is not just limited to these kinds of rights alone, but there are huge differences in conceptualization of rights as well. So what does it mean to have right, what kind of right is regarded as true rights or others as metaphysical or some kind of imaginary rights which is not enforceable but it has some other kind of authority. So the tension and conflicts in rights is not just about the kinds of right but also about the conception of rights, the different theories on rights. So in this lecture today we will discuss some of these theories of rights such as libertarian, communitarian and multiculturalist conception of rights. In the difference between a moral and legal law, we have discussed already in the previous lecture that morality demands that men should act from a sense of moral, ethical duty or responsibility. Now this morality has no enforcing authority from the state and moral laws comes from people's perception of what is right or what is wrong. So it has certain form of authority or effectiveness in a sense that it is based on the people's perception, their collective perception about how a man should act and how men should act morally or ethically. However, it does not have the backing of the state. If some individual violate those ethical moral codes, then he or she cannot be held responsible by the court of law. However, it has general social or common authority. So that is the source of moral authority which lacks the uh, backing of the state and its court. Whereas the legal rights are enforceable, however it is silent on many moral problems or challenges that a humanity face. So one of this example in contemporary times say, is the refugee issue. So human beings because of certain natural or man-made calamities used to uh, take shelter in different parts of the world. Now contemporary world which is also a world of nation state where every nation guards its border and it is not easy to move from one nation state to other nation state without seeking the proper visa or uh, passport and so on. Now if uh, a group of communities faces persecution in his or her home state, then to move or to seek shelter or uh, asylum in another state has become a not merely legal issue but also a moral issue. And on uh, this issue whether the uh, mass movement from one nation to the other nation should be justified. So in the case of say Rohingya in uh, contemporary times is uh, a case of a refugee where uh, it invokes certain moral as well as the legal issues that is involved whether we should grant asylum to these people or not and on what ground we should uh, deny such asylum and so on. So this issue of legal and illegal becomes contentious and legality do not provide the solution to many of the moral problems that humanity is facing. So that is the kind of distinctions between legal and moral rights and this we have discussed in the previous lecture also. So there have been significant conflicts also in constituting both civil and political and also economic and social rights. So many theorists and scholars have argued that in conflict between so, uh, say political and civil, civil rights should be given more significance than political rights or um, in conflict between civil and political rights on the one hand and social and economic rights on the other hand, the civil and political rights should be given primacy to the social and economic rights. However, contrary to this kind of argument, there are many scholars who have argued that uh, civil and political sense will have no significance or very less significance for those who do not have their basic needs met. In other words, without the social and economic rights, the so, uh, civil and political rights will have very little significance, very little meaning uh, to, uh, to them. So these conflicts are also there when we think about different kinds of rights. Now we will first discuss this conception of uh, right as argued by Ronald Dworkin 
in his text called Taking Rights Seriously. And this is in response to those scholars and theorists, especially he is a jurist or arguing about rights from juridical or from the position of jurisprudence. And jurisprudence uh, provide the basis for the interpretation of certain laws, legislation and policies of the state and so on. So, those theorists or legal scholars who argued that there is sufficient ground to curtail or to limit the rights of individual if such limitation or curtailment is in the benefit of the larger good or the common good of the society or the humanity. Now, against this kind of argument, Ronald Dworkin is arguing about the uh, significance or uh, inalienability in a sense of uh, rights, where he uh, want uh, those scholars to take rights seriously as the name su suggests. So, uh, right is not something which can be compromised or trade off between other kinds of goods or goods for the humanity. Rights are something which is considered inalienable, very uh, uh, essential for the growth of individual and it cannot be traded off with some other goods or some other moral political values. So, in this essay, Taking Rights Seriously, philosopher and constitutional lawyer Ronald Dworkin argued that rights are trumps. By this phrase, rights are trumps, he meant that the basic rights must take precedence over other norms, including the interest or welfare of the whole community or the whole society. So, there are certain fundamental rights which must be given primacy to any other goods that may society collectively think are desirable. So, in other words, the rights are the possessions of individual which cannot be taken away or which cannot be traded off with some other goods. So, rights therefore, are individual possessions which cannot be violated simply because such violence benefit other individuals or society as a whole. So, in Ronald Dworkin conception of rights is something which is the position of individual which cannot be violated even if such violation is in the interest of other individuals or group of individuals or even uh, for this uh, good of society as a whole or community as a whole. So, in that sense in this conception rights are considered inevitable uh, or essential position of the individual which must not be uh, taken away or uh, infringed upon for the sake of other goods or the goods of uh, the whole society. So, it is based on those foundational or constitutional notions of rights that are used by the courts in the jurisprudence. So, jurisprudence as I have explained are the sources uh, on the basis of which court determines the legality of any legislation passed by parliament or by any organs of the um, executive or the machinery of the state or any violation done to the uh, private individual and so on. So, the jurisprudence um, is much more broader and bigger than the law, law in a sense of positive, uh, posi uh, positivist um, codified laws in the constitution we are in, in the legislation, there are written words. Now, to interpret that written words and its actual application in a given situation, its interpretation requires something more than that is written, which we call uh, jurisprudence. So, this understanding of rights is based on those foundational or constitutional notion of rights that are used by courts to override legislation contrary to these rights, even if such legislations are democratically endorsed or claim to serve the public good. Now, here we need to understand, uh, we can take the example say of Indian constitution. So, parliament is empowered to enact a legislation in the service of uh, people or for the benefit of the people. Now, in enacting such legislation, it cannot violate certain principles of the constitution or certain rights that is given to the individual by the constitution. If it does so, then 
such person or uh, um, the member of that society may take recourse to the court, that means Supreme Court or the High Court, which then uh, review these uh, legislation enacted by the parliament or duly enacted by the parliament and then decide how far that enactment is in contrary to the principles of constitution or violate the rights that is protected uh, in the constitution. And so far it violates or limits those uh, enactments or legislation can be nullified by the, uh, by the constitution. So here we are talking about reviewing a parliament uh, act or legislation through the uh, constitutional mechanism, through the constitutional principles. Similarly, in uh, many other issues, the laws which is passed by the parliament uh, by following the procedure du duly established or even if it claims to serve the common good, yet those laws or enactments can be nullified or can be uh, overridden uh, by the court using the jurisprudence or the foundational ideas of uh, the rights which is enshrined in the constitution or in such texts. So, the conception of rights that Dworkin is arguing about is such kind of rights where those rights cannot be taken away even by the parliamentary legislation in the name of serving the common good or uh, so on. So, uh, rights for Dworkin is very essential for the growth of individual. Now, to understand the rights, we can uh, look at rights in its relationship with the duties and obligation. And if we do so, we identify four types of rights as argued by Wesley Hopfield in the foundational legal conception. So, these four kinds of rights are liberty rights, claim rights, power rights or immunities. Basically, these rights can be understood in its relationship with corresponding or correlation with duties and obligation of that right bearing citizen. So, one such kind of rights is liberty rights. Now, this liberty rights allow a person to do something or to get something done without any corresponding obligation. So, certain rights are recognized for the individual to grow without necessarily uh, corresponding uh, duties and obligation for individual to do to exercise those rights. So, um, uh, that person who has these liberty rights are at liberty to do things without any corresponding obligation. So, he or she is free to do certain things without any consideration or without any requirement to do some corresponding duties or obligation to exercise those rights. So, those rights are considered as uh, liberty rights. Second is right to speech or freedom of speech and expression can be regarded as liberty rights or to opt for a particular profession, teaching, uh, doctor, lawyer and so on. The claim rights are based on the person's corresponding duties and obligation it may be both negative and positive. So, the claim rights are basically the uh, claims that we make for the growth of our own uh, personality, for our own uh, development from the society and the state. Now, these claims can be both negative and positive as I have discussed in my previous lecture about this negative and positive conception of rights, where uh, one kind of claims prevent other person or other person here means the society or state to do something. So, say right to life is one such right which prevents the other to get me killed. So, my right to life is a claim which prevents the other to do something for me to exercise this right. So, that is a kind of uh, uh, claim which is negative claims. The positive claims would be where we want the society or state to provide the condition for me to exercise or to play a proactive role for me to exercise certain rights. So, these rights can be both um, positive or negative rights which we call the claim rights. So, right to education and some other things which requires the state proactive roles or society's role in order for individual to exercise his uh, rights or to make certain choices 
and uh, acquire certain capabilities and so on. The third kind of rights are power rights, which enables the holder of uh, this right to change the rights and duties for not only themselves, but also for others. So, these rights, the power rights, certainly to some institution or some leaders, the power rights enables the individual to change the rights and duties both of themselves or the others. Immunities is something uh, which is given to uh, the bearer of this right, which cannot be changed or curtailed by others. So, it enables the individual immune from having his rights and duties changed or controlled by others. So, certain rights are considered therefore, the immune rights. Now, if you quickly move on to this different theories on rights, foremost among them is this libertarian theory of rights, which talks about that individual and his welfare and happiness must be given primacy to the welfare and happiness of collectives or the communities. So, this libertarian conception of giving primacy to individual and his welfare and happiness, an individual here is understood as self-defining autonomous individual, which is independent and above the society or the collectivity. So, libertarian argument is based on this premise of understanding individual as a self-defining unit or a subject, which is autonomous from the society or the collective body. So, they argues about this uh, giving primacy to the welfare and the happiness of the individual over the collectives or the communities. Now, this argument is in, in response to the egalitarianism, multicultural or the communitarian arguments about equality, rights and justice. The most prominent champion of this uh, libertarian theory of rights in contemporary times is Robert Nozick. His book Anarchy, State and Utopia, published after John Rawls A Theory of Justice, we are referring to John Rawls again and again in the topic on equality also, we refer to uh, his argument, especially when talking about distributional aspect of uh, equality. And in the next topic that is on justice, we will discuss in some uh, detail about uh, different um, elements in Rawls theory of justice and it uh, why it is considered a significant conceptualization of um, a theory in modern times and how it led to a series of argument and counter arguments about the conception of justice. So, this anarchy, state and utopia of Robert Nozick was published after the publication of Rawls theory of justice. This book is a libertarian reply to the egalitarian theory of Rawls. So, why Rawls theory is considered egalitarian, we will discuss, but this conception of uh, justice is responded to by this uh, text of uh, Robert Nozick called Anarchy, State and Utopia, where he defended the right to property and in no circumstances, if property is acquired justly, it should be infringed upon or in, it should be taken away for the redistributional purposes. So, Rawls in this book tried to reconcile the concern of equality and community with the demands and concerns of liberty and development of the individual. So, Rawls theory of justice is a kind of reconcilement of these two opposing concerns and demands of individual and community equality and liberty and so on. So, therefore, the Rawls tries to reconcile between these two opposing aspiration of individual and community. In response to that kind of theory, uh, Nozick argued that each individual has certain rights such as property rights, which are absolute. And he argued against the infringement of this right to property of the individual in the name of collective goods or welfare. So, his conception of justice is also called entitlement theory of justice. So, if individual acquire his or her property that gives uh, or if such acquiring is on the basis of just principle or through just means, then it gives the individual certain entitlements which cannot be taken away 
in the name of larger good or the collective good. So, he gives two ways in which wealth can be legitimately or justly acquired by the individual. What are these means? First, he argued that a person who acquired the property in accordance with the principle of justice is entitled to that property. So, the individual entitlement to a property is based on this principle that whether he or she has acquired that property through legitimate means or not. And if such acquiring is on the basis of legitimate or just means, then he or she is entitled to that property. Now, the second principle of acquiring the property is that if a person has acquired that property through the legitimate transfer from someone who is the rightful owner of that property. So, if someone is the rightful owner of property and if he or she transfers that property to the other individual, then that other individual is entitled to that property because it is transferred to him or her by someone who is the rightful owner of that property. Now, these are the two basic criteria of acquiring property which Nozick talks about and any other criteria through which property is acquired he considered as unjust. So, the only uh, mechanism through which a property can be acquired is to these two means and if it is such then it is just and legitimate and individual is entitled to that property. If it is acquired through other means then it should be uh, regarded as unjust acquire, uh, acquiring and so on. Now, Nozick wanted past injustices or the historical injustices to be rectified. However, his principle is essentially in defense of free market liberal economy. So, Nozick wanted to give primacy to the liberty and individual autonomy or freedom without any consideration to the redistributional aspect or equalizing factor that is argued by many egalitarian theorists and scholars. So, he wanted individual to be given maximum liberty regardless of its consequences on the collective welfare or the economic implications of such liberty. So, in this conflict what we find is on the one hand we have a range of scholars arguing about creating a society more equal, more egalitarian even if it requires limiting or, or curtailing the rights of the individual. Libertarian on the other hand wants the society to not just uh, give maximum freedom, but even if such freedom leads to some inequalities in the society or some uh, adverse implication in the society, even that is good because such process uh, is uh, just if we, uh, we acquire the property and we allow the individual to acquire the property through just means. Now, the next perspectives on right is the communitarian perspective that is in contrast to what we have just discussed about the libertarian theory of rights. Uh, communitarians regard rights or justice as important for the progress and development of the individual and society. So, like libertarians, communitarians equally regard rights and justice as very significant for the growth of individual and society. However, they criticize first the ahistorical and the external criteria which is applied by the liberals to criticize the actual and the everyday lived realities of communities in the society. So, they want uh, this discourse on rights should be sensitive to the actual lived realities of the communities or different communities in the society and not having a kind of hypothetical abstract or a historical assumption about certain uh, rights. So, in the natural right theorist or the social contract traditions we have uh, seen how individual is assumed to be independent and autonomous of the uh, society and his or her community. But in the actual lived reality, individual is always embedded in his or her community. However, the libertarian or liberal sticks a historical or abstract understanding of that individual. So, the communitarian criticized that aspect of liberals and communitarian criticized the understanding of individual as self-defining autonomous subject as it is uh, argued by the liberals or libertarians. 
and they criticized not the universality or the emphasis on justice, but the liberal conception of individual. So, for the communitarians, individual is not an abstract category or entity, but is deeply embedded in his or her social and cultural community. And if that is so, so one kind of understanding of individual as self-defining autonomous individual is challenged and criticized by the communitarians, which believes that individual is embedded in his or her social and cultural community. And that embeddedness gives certain uh, world view, defines the welfare or the sense of welfare to that individual. Now, when we discuss about the rights, we must take into account those differences, those cultural and social differences of individual. So, in the liberal conception, individual well-being and happiness is seen as independent and autonomous of his or her community. Whereas, communitarians argue that individual makes sense of and enjoy his or her well-being or happiness in his or her community. And therefore, they argue that while allocating rights to the individual, we should also take into account his social and cultural backgrounds. So, in other words, unlike liberal conception which wants certain rights to be given to everyone universally. So, there is no uh, difference or differentiation between two set of individuals. Communitarians argues about granting certain rights to individual, not because he is regarded as autonomous self-defining individual, but because he or she belongs to a certain community. So, the membership to that community should also entitle that individual to have certain differential rights and so on. So, Michael Sandel in his book, Liberalism and the Limits of Justice argue for the amendment of the liberal nation of politics of rights, for the politics of common good. Now, what is this common good is about the idea of shared uh, goal or shared objective. Now, liberal premise according to Sandel is flawed because conceptualize an absolute or the universal notion of justice or rights, it also believes in the absence of common shared goal among the individual. So, it believes that individual knows what is good for him or her and he or she collectively cannot formulate something which would should be a shared ideal and so on. So, Michael Sandel criticized the uh, liberal ideals which is based on certain flawed premises such as it believes in the absolute and the universal notion of justice, it also believes in the absence of common shared goal an individual who is independent of common shared goods and ends and so on. So, now these are some of the flaws of the liberal uh, premises which uh, uh, regards individual as a unit and therefore, the rights should be uh, distributed on the basis of uh, understanding that the society is constitutive of individual and individual has their own rights, their own uh, sense of uh, good and there is, uh, uh, there is no uh, collective uh, or shared uh, good which can be defined or which can be applicable to everyone in the society. So, therefore, the liberals argued about the individual as the right bearing citizen and not the collective or the uh, society. So, Michael Sandel uh, uh, questioned that kind of argument in liberalism. Michael Walger is another such communitarian uh, scholars who argue that very quest for a universal theory of rights is misguided and for him the best way to and Michael Walger we have discussed in our lecture on equality also uh, where we were discussing about the complex equality. So, for Michael Walger the best way to identify the rights and goods is to find out how a particular community understand the value of social good. So, for Walger, the good or social good is something which is socially constituted. It cannot be uh, uh, decided a priori or through philosophical argumentation or counter argumentation, but society together, the communities together constitute what is shared, what they value as the social goods. So, he believed that the principles that govern or that should govern the discourse on rights 
should be based on the shared believed and understandings of all members in the society and in this way for Volger, rights and justice are more about cultural interpretation than about philosophical arguments and he argued that shared principles of rights and justice required complex equality that is a system of distribution that does not try to equalize all good like the egalitarian and those who believed in the equality of outcome uh, do. But it seeks to ensure that inequalities in one sphere do not permeate into the other sphere. So that is what uh, Michael Walger argued about the first social constitution of good and second that it should be based on the participation or on the beliefs of every member in the society and uh, society must not ensure to equalize the distribution of good, but it must ensure that inequality in one sphere must not influence or permeates in the other sphere of life and that is how he was arguing about. Um, about uh, differential or uh, differentiated rights depending upon the uh, uh, different conception of uh, social good in by different uh, uh, communities. Now, if you move on to this multicultural perspectives of right, one of the biggest challenge of liberal democracies in the contemporary time is to reconcile between the ideal of equality on the one hand and social, economic and cultural differences of the community on the other hand. There is an urge to equalize, to give everyone equal access, to treat everyone equally, but there is a simultaneous presence or existence of socio-economic and cultural differences. Now to reconcile between these two, the urge or the aspiration for equality and the simultaneous presence of social, economic and cultural differences is some of the biggest or one of the central uh, challenge in the modern, uh, before the modern liberal democracy. So the role of democratic state in treating everyone with equal concern and respect are increasingly being questioned as such uniform and universal approach do not make the distinction between the individuals from different social economic backgrounds. So this is also an approach which is based on the understanding of individual belonging to a particular community and that belongingness to particular community also shapes or determines the value of that individual or the opportunity for that individual. Now when a liberal state follow a universal or uniform approach to redistribute it does not understand the differential need of different individuals belonging to actual uh, different communities in the society. So they make a distinction between the formal and real and genuine. So this universal uniform approach such as as we have discussed political and the legal equality. This is a very formal notion of equality. This does not turn into the substantive or the actual realization of equality in life because of the socio-economic and the cultural differences that exist in the society. So they make this distinction between the formal and the real or genuine equality and argue that uh, difference blind approach that is the uniform approach treat everyone equally that approach is blind to the actual existing differences in the society. So argue that difference blind approach to rights are insensitive to the differential needs of the individuals and community. So the needs of a sick man or a healthy man or male or a female or a grown up adult or a child or a minority or uh, a person belonging to a minority community or ethnic, religious, linguistic minority communities or groups or a person belonging to the majoritarian groups are different. Therefore in treating them, we must be sensitive to their differential needs and do not have a kind of difference blind uniform universal approach to the rights. So they argue for group rights should be recognized for ethnic groups and national minorities. So we have one such thinker Will Kimlicka, he argued about uh, the need for uh,
he argued for the need um, of uh, recognizing the needs of the individual who belongs to a minority community or a national minority communities and uh, he goes on to make other kind of uh, groups like immigrants groups poly ethnic groups and so on but here we need uh, to understand that um, how the needs of a national minorities are different from those who belong to a national majority community so um, there are chances that the economic or the political decisions taken by the majority because of their large number have certain negative implications and consequences on the social and the cultural practices of a minority communities now in that uh, situation even without their fault they are victim of the policies made by the uh, uh, national majority so to prevent such kind of situations wilkimlicka argues about giving a special representation giving more uh, autonomy to giving uh, uh, rights which is based on uh, their language giving ownership to the land and so on and it, in that way the uh, condition of the minorities or the national minorities can be protected from the encroachment from uh, the majority communities and similarly then uh, the society can be made more equal even when there is a kind of differential treatment depending upon the condition and the status of different communities in the society so in other words these thinkers are arguing about the group differentiated rights rather than a uniform universal rights similarly viku parekh argues that in a multicultural society there exist a number of cultural linguistic and religious community which generally demand various kinds of rights which are not possible to be accommodated within the liberal jurisprudence of rights which is based on the individual rights so demands of different communities is not possible to be accommodated within this liberal jurisprudence of rights now however there is danger of group rights as well first how far group rights are coherent or logical not all the claims as we have discussed we make which we think is necessary for our growth turn out to be the right because it needs to be recognized by the society that these claims are necessary for the individual to grow similarly the uh, different communities different groups in the society making different claims are not necessarily coherent or logical so not all demands of groups can be regarded as logical and this is the problem with the multicultural or the communitarian theories so the liberal theorists which believes in a kind of a contextual abstract ideals or assumptions about the individual and guaranteeing or sanctioning certain rights to the individual not because he or she is member to a particular community but because he is regarded as the human being or as a rational being so therefore he has certain rights which is inalienable and so on now these multiculturalist or the communitarians which believes in the individual being embedded in a community and therefore rights should be differential keeping in mind the belongingness to a particular community uh, do not have a convincing answer to this problem that should all the uh, demands or claims of the community or groups be regarded by the majority community or the rest of the community how far that claim is uh, logical or rational if it is not then how to tackle such kind of situation so in the multicultural or communitarian perspectives on rights also we will see a kind of basic assumptions that is similar to uh, liberalism however their uh, difference is their emphasis on the community and groups as equal or as significant than the identity of the individual so the emphasis for them is the community rather than the individual and individual carry certain rights because of his membership to that particular community like national minorities linguistic minorities and so on now finally we will discuss this asian value debates on the rights which emerged in the 1990s with a growing consciousness among many asian leaders like lee kuan yew of singapore that western conception of human rights we will have one lecture on human rights and rights and duties uh, separately 
So, this growing consciousness about western conception of rights or limited and selfishness lead to this uh, debate in a theory which we call Asian value debates. Of course, within Asia there is a lot of varieties and differences or heterogeneities. However, there is a kind of response to the western conception of human rights which is considered as culturally insensitive or different from the overall set of values of the non-western especially the Asian society. So, in contrast to western emphasis on individual and his or her exclusive rights, these Asian leaders have argued that Asian values, these terms are not homogeneous within it there is a lots of differences or heterogeneities as I have said. However, they argue that the Asian value give priority to community lives rather than individual, social order, respect for authority, general welfare, loyalty to family, state and nation and so on. So, that is the kind of response to the western focus on the individual and his or her exclusive rights. Thus, in contrast to the western conception of rights that focuses on individual over general welfare, in the Asian countries it is argued that there are major cultural and historical differences which do not allow the western commentators to appropriately comprehend these values which sustain both individual and collective lives in these communities. So, they argue that in these society historically and culturally their sense of welfare and happiness is constituted very differently on different set of values which is not always understood or appropriately comprehended by the western theorist or the commentators. So, these values are often regarded by the western theorists or scholars as some values which justify the authoritarian rule and the governments. So, for the many western scholars and the theorists, these values enable the conditions which lead to authoritarian rule or government in this society. However, these Asian values or realization of these values are result of growing consciousness among the Asian countries about the limited, selfish, destructive parts of modern western capitalism or modes of development. So, in many Asian societies say in China the Confucius philosophy or in India or in Southeast Asian uh, countries there is this growing realization of the limitedness or selfishness of the western conception of uh, theory or individual or how to govern the collective life as self uh, uh, destructive and therefore, they uh, realize that the Asian values are different which not only help in uh, organizing the collective political or social life, but also to provide enabling condition for the individual and community to live together to sustain his or her life in the lives of community. So, that growing realization of the values which sustain the individual and collective life in the Asia is regarded as different from the western conception of liberty. So, that is all in today's lecture. So, we have seen different uh, conception of rights, um, especially we began with uh, uh, Ronald Dworkin where he argues about uh, taking rights seriously and also to identify four kinds of right, we see uh, through uh, relationship of rights with uh, corresponding obligation and duties like liberty rights, claim rights, power rights or immunities and so on. Then finally, we have discussed uh, this libertarian, multicultural or the communitarian perspective of rights, where the basic things that we need to take in, uh, into consideration is that understanding of the individual. So, who carries the rights and on what grounds? So, libertarian argues believing in the individual, his capability or his rights to acquire property to lead his life the way he or she wants to lead is based on this assumption that individual is the self-defining individual. Whereas, the multicultural or the communitarians argues about the embeddedness of the individual in his horror community and therefore, the rights that we sanction or recognize or protect of these individual should be on the basis of his or her membership to that community, be it national minorities, polyethnic groups or so on and so forth. However, what uh, communitarians or multiculturalists fail to understand or convincingly argue is how far or what kind of claims can be regarded as legitimate claims 
logical claims or which claims can be regarded as illogical or um, incoherent or illegitimate. So, there is no adequate answer to such kind of dilemma. In there, we also find some kind of liberal uh, assumptions also guides many uh, arguments of the multiculturalist and, uh, and communitarians, where they agree to have some common assumptions agreed upon principles or values by all the communities. And within that, then they can start with the different understanding of goods, different approaches to goods and, uh, and so on. So, topics we have covered in this lecture, you can refer to some of this literature like Papiya Sen Gupta Talukdar, Rights from Rajiv Bhargam and Asoka Acharya, Hoffman and Paul Graham, Introduction to Political Theory or Katriana Mackinnon, Issues in Political Theory, Norman P. Berry, in Introduction to Modern Political Theory and Drezek and Philip, The Oxford Handbook of Political Theory. So, you can refer to some of these books for what we have covered in today's lecture. So, that is all for today. Thank you for listening. Thanks all.